So, after a long journey through production, Nimona finally dropped on Friday. And yeah, I really liked it. Big ups to Annapurna and Netflix for taking it on and seeing it to completion after Disney scrapped the project for being too gay a few years back. Also, big shout out to ND. He created another heater for the girls, the gays, and the theys. Gotta give it up. If you're like me and haven't gotten around to reading the graphic novel yet, I'll give a brief summary. 1,000 years ago, a hero named Glorith vanquished an evil monster who attacked her kingdom. After banishing the evil back to the shadows from whence it came, she trained an elite force of knights to protect the kingdom. The descendants of those knights were to be part of a noble class and the knights of the generations to come. Our story begins on an unprecedented night. The knighting ceremony for this generation is including a commoner for the first time in history, a man named Ballister, who has proved himself and graduated at the top of his class. Everything is going according to plan, and it even seems like he is one over the more skeptical people of the kingdom. However, this moment is ruined when his sword malfunctions, killing the queen. In the confusion, Ballister's arm is cut off and he flees into the shadows, framed for a crime he did not commit. One day, while he's laying low, a chaotic shapeshifter named Nimona appears at his door. With a capable sidekick and a newfound determination, Ballister sets out on a quest to clear his name. This movie has a lot of heart, and at its very core is a queer story. One about identity and self-acceptance. Nimona is a product of Indy Stevenson's feelings and life experiences, and is a representation of gender nonconformance. And while this movie embraces wonderful topics of acceptance and self-love, it also touches on the darker sides, such as depression, isolation, abandonment, and self-harm. It handles these themes beautifully, while constantly reminding us that Nimona is just Nimona. She doesn't owe anyone an explanation on what exactly she is or how she got to this point. So I love how she shoots down Ballister's closed-minded questions. One of the most beautiful scenes in the movie is when the two have a heart-to-heart. Bal asks her if shapeshifting hurts, to which she replies that she feels worse when she doesn't do it, and that a life without shapeshifting wouldn't really be living. And the movie is filled with moments like these, when the characters have a greater understanding of each other and gain a new appreciation for one another because of it. These aspects of the movie greatly enhance the story, and it made me appreciate it more due to the creative team's fight to get this movie finished. That's why it's appalling yet somehow hilarious how losers on the internet are throwing a fit about three scenes with gay representation when the movie itself has an extremely LGBTQ plus identity. I've seen a lot of people saying that the movie would have been a 10 out of 10 without the gay representation, somehow not noticing the gay undertones that the entire film has, but that just goes to show that they don't have any comprehension skills, which we already knew. That being said, this is a movie that can be enjoyed by anyone. Anyone who has ever felt like they don't belong can relate to Ballister and Nimona, which is beautiful. Just for fun though, I want to read some of the all-timers from the one-star review section. <clears throat> this movie is very disappointing. Why are there two men kissing in this? A lot of punctuation in this post. The movie started great. Graphic was phenomenal. Until the end. OMG. It shows one chapter promotes homosexuality. Seriously, guys. Why? Uh, it's for <laughs> it's for a kids, for God's sake. A man will be a man until he leaves this life. I don't recommend. <laughs> I don't recommend it for kids at all. Stop planting your beliefs on the other people. No one cares. Leave the kids in the entire world alone. Angry, angry, angry. Sixty-one people found this helpful. <laughs> this movie was rated as a PG. This movie was rated as a PG, and I decided it would be a good movie for my grandkids and I to watch. Not knowing that the movie featured two men proclaiming their love for one another, then to kiss was absolutely appalling. Shame on you. How did Nimona become a shapeshifter? What is Nimona? Apparently you can't ask that. You're expected to just accept it without question. In that regard, it's a perfect metaphor. <laughs> it's a perfect metaphor for the woke mindset. So, so true. Great movie, up until they have two men kiss at the end. This movie should be rate it R. This leads to my children asking questions to things I didn't want them exposed to. Very disappointed. Would have been a five star if it didn't have LGBTQ content. I myself am bi, but I don't believe small and young children need to have this in their movies until they are older due to the fact that kids learn off what they see. 20 people found this helpful. Seek help. <laughs> like, they brainwashed you good. This is a disgraceful movie. How can you bring in gay love into a kid's movie? <laughs> How can you bring in gay love into a kid's movie? This world is confusing enough for them. Now you bring in nonsense like this? I cannot believe this. I do not recommend this movie for any children. This movie should be banned. Exclamation mark. This one, this one takes the cake. 
G L G B Q G L G G L B T Q woke propaganda. <laughs> Thumbs down. When will Netflix learn that only 10% of the population want children to be indoctrinated into that lifestyle? The 90% majority definitely do not. Try again, Netflix. Okay. Mid. But have to give it one star because the creators push some kind of trans allegory, which most people don't get. They might like the character, but if it's if it is represented as what they state it is some kind of propaganda wow this guy's a genius like he's onto something this is not kid appropriate at all two men in love and an evil demon is praised it basically praises evil as good and good as evil i'm not gonna lie she kind of ate with this interpretation like like who's gonna clap back to this one she she got us Okay, that's enough of that. Can't have those guys getting rich and famous off my YouTube channel, you know what I'm saying? Those guys are fucking leeches. That's exactly what they would want. They have zero respect, no shame. Like and subscribe. Anyways, these criticisms are dumb. Let's talk about mine instead. Honestly, I don't have many, but the biggest issue for me, it was Todd. Not just his character, because I realized he was meant to be a prick, but his inclusion in the movie at all, I genuinely don't understand it. He has no bearing on the story whatsoever. He never felt like a real threat and everything he did could have been done by somebody else. He's not funny, his voice was annoying, his face was punchable and he had no redeeming qualities. And no, I'm not counting that little thing he did at the end as a redemption. Maybe he was more important in the graphic novels or more palatable, but I wouldn't know. I'm just going off of how I felt. Another thing that really annoyed me was how Ballister was this close to not falling in the whole liar reveal cliche near the start of the final act. Like when the evidence was presented to him, I looked at the time step and I thought to myself, there's no way he's gonna turn on her after they just become friends. It was about 15 minutes after Bao truly accepted Nimona and considered her a close friend to when he turned on her again, which I know was necessary to push the final conflict, but it still felt forced to me. There was a literal this you moment near the end of the second act and I don't know, it just didn't feel natural to me. A two steps forward, three steps back kind of situation. Yeah, let me get a uh, two quick picks in the- Donnell, that's you? <laughs> boy, boy look at you, boy looking like 1968. <laughs> Go ahead on boy. Hey, nah. I'm fooling with you today. I'm fooling with you now. <laughs> Speaking of that moment, it came about because a villain was trying to cover for themselves after their secret came out. And the only reason the evidence against the villain was under any contention could have easily been resolved. I'm going to try my best to explain this without spoilers, but this will probably make a lot more sense to people who've already seen the film. Okay, so there was a video, a confession from the person who framed Bao. And later, when the evidence is presented to the kingdom, the villain is just like, but that ain't even me though. And then everyone just takes it at face value. And okay, I, I get that it's supposed to be like, oh, people are gonna believe what they wanna believe. I'm, I'm not, I, I get it, I get it. But let me be mad about this for a second. Because this could have easily been resolved with some better camera angles or if the video had gone on for just a few seconds longer. Because the villain does something that, according to the kingdom's understanding, would have been seen as an irrefutable crime right before the confession. So show that in the video you broadcast and then the kingdom can't just go back to trusting the villain right after. Now I'm going to say this in more concise terms but with spoilers this time. So if you don't want to hear that, skip forward to this timestamp. Three, two, one, go. Okay, I just don't understand why Ballister didn't upload the entire video of Nimona entering the director's chambers disguised as Ambrosius, the director's speech about how she saw Bao becoming a knight being a threat to the kingdom, her attacking who she believed to be the top knight in the kingdom in cold blood, as well as her verbal confession of framing Ballister and killing the queen. Then also including Nimona shapeshifting out of Ambrosius' form to clear up any misconceptions about who you can and can't trust. That way, all the evidence would be there for everyone to see and the director couldn't weasel her way out of it. And I guess some people can say like, oh, the kingdom wasn't accepting of shapeshifters so they would see blah, blah, blah. They would see Nimona as the villain and blah, blah, blah. But I feel like it would be the, it would have the opposite effect. Honestly, um, I feel like it would be killing two birds with one stone. You would be clearing Ballister's name as well as showing that Nimona is an ally to the kingdom. She, she helped. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> That's just me though. 
Okay, I'm out of spoiler territory again, but something else I noticed about the villain is that it's pretty obvious who it is if you look for it, but that's not like an issue or anything. It's a movie, not a mystery novel. There's also a moment at the end when Ballister is on top of Glora's statue, but like it didn't show how he got there. He just kind of showed up in the nick of time, but stuff like that doesn't really matter and it made for a good moment, so I can't really complain about it. Something that did confuse me though was the world building. There's a moment at the beginning of the movie when Nimona asks Ballister if he's ever been outside and he says no because he doesn't have a death wish. Then again somewhere near the middle um, Ballister says that he and Nimona could flee to the outside world and that's like seen as a great act of friendship where he's willing to kind of give up his life in the kingdom to live with Nimona while they're like on the run. That's cute. Okay. But then at the end the wall is broken and the kingdom sees that there isn't anything to fear outside of the walls. And I understand that this is another way to represent how the people of the kingdom were conditioned by the Institute to fear anything that was unknown to them. And now they're embracing things that are different. But I was just a little confused because the citizens never seemed to acknowledge that they felt trapped within the system in the first place. Hopefully I'm articulating this well, but take this example. In Attack on Titan, Armin is a character who wants to experience the world and all the diversity it has to offer. At one time, seeing something as vast as the ocean was his driving force for wanting to go beyond the walls. It was his end game even though he knew for a fact that Titans were a real threat. That motivation endures us to Armin as a character while also getting us interested in the outside world. So that moment when the scouts finally make it to the ocean after all they've been through, it means something. Now, if Armin had never shown interest in what was outside of the walls, that moment when he sees the ocean wouldn't have meant nearly as much to him or the viewer. That's kind of what it felt like when the outside world was revealed in Nimona and like all the citizens were kind of gathering around the hole in the wall. There was never a point in the movie when any character showed any interest in leaving the kingdom so that moment at the end didn't feel as earned as it could have. But I get it, time constraints, and again, this may have been something that was elaborated on more in the graphic novel. Oh, and this has nothing to do with anything, but there's a scene where Nimona transforms into a cartoon dragon from a cereal box. That all makes sense, but instead of fire breathing, she breathes giant balls of cereal or maybe instead of cereal it's supposed to be like a part of herself they're just giant pink balls they're just giant pink balls huh and like how does that even work and the balls didn't even disappear when she shipped it back like not everything has to make perfect sense but that stuck out to me besides those small things overall i had a really good experience watching the movie so now let's talk about the positives i really like nimona bal and the friendship they had these two work off each other really well and this is only amplified by the stellar voice acting riz and chloe do an amazing job as our leads the entire cast did a great job and without them the comedy wouldn't have landed nearly as much as it did oh and another thing this film is really fucking pretty there's not much more for me to say but yeah it looks great I love the cell shaded approach a lot of films are taking nowadays and the use of lighting and color in this movie is great. The colors really pop and the characters are expressive and fluid. Our main duo definitely steal the show when it comes to expressiveness. These bitches be emoting. Every time Ballister was scared all I could think of was Puss in Boots. The characters are fun. The character design is great. The story was interesting. The music was nice. The comedy lands. And there were some real points of tension as well as extremely heartfelt moments. Pretty much anything I didn't mention earlier, I really enjoyed from this movie. So yeah, all in all, I highly recommend Nimona. It's a great time. I don't want to make a habit out of rating everything I watch, but if I had to rate Nimona, I think it will fall between a 7.5 and an 8 for me personally. Oh, oh, and something I forgot to mention is that Ballister and Ambrosius's relationship is so fucking cute. Like, it's so cute. I love them. Um, what else? What else? There's a character that kind of looks like Madame Raz from She-Ra. So I take back what I said earlier. This movie is a 10 out of 10. Bye!